in the church where the crafts have their reserved pews or in the wealthier cities in the church that serves the crafts exclusively the master would also sit with his apprentices and then more broadly with other masters and craftsmen of his particular trade so the cobblers sit together the bakers and so forth there is certainly in this system of craft production a market if you think of a medieval city what comes to mind first after the, the walls and towers and so forth is the market where people exchange anything. And this is still true in the early modern period where Winthrop lives. And every city is to a large degree defined by the fact that the citizens have received at one point the right to host a market in that city. That is one of the most common reasons for why there is a city in the first place. But this market is not a free market in the sense that you can sell whatever you want at whatever price. Rather, this marketplace is embedded in the moral economy that governs everything people do. So when a craftsman offers his goods, the prices he can ask are set by custom. They're oft this is often written down, but more often than not, it is simply known what you can charge. And the wages that he has to pay his journeymen and apprentices likewise are set by custom there is a sense that there is such a thing as a fair price and a fair wage so what is the standard of fairness here if you're looking at a capitalist at a free marketplace the standard of fairness is simply that both parties have agreed to pay that price and the assumption is they all make up their own mind whether it is worth their while to pay that price or to sell for that price in the moral economy, the standard for fairness is the livelihood. In other words, the question whether as a result of these prices and these wages, everybody who contributes to the economic life of the city and the country can make a decent living at their station. Now, a decent living at one station is not a bare minimum thing. It includes certainly the ability to represent um, and buy something nice for yourself if you're a master or even a journeyman. It is a little more basic for apprentices, obviously. But the notion that it should be possible for somebody to work a full-time job and not be able to meet their basic needs would be alien to people at the time, whereas nowadays this is quite common. So the livelihood is obviously a moving target as society becomes richer and more sophisticated as more things are introduced the answer to the question what should a person be entitled to ch changes when there was no coffee when there was no tobacco that didn't enter into the equation at some point after the discovery of the americas that changes and it becomes part of the tradition to say, yes, a journeyman should be able to buy a pound of coffee every now and then. And that means that the wage has to adjust upward. But of course, the prices that people have to pay for goods on the market have to be high enough so that the masters can pay all their underlings what they deserve. So for that reason, there is not just one craft, there are not just the crafts in the city, there is a bigger picture. There is the merchants, the clergy, some day laborers, and so forth. So you need an instance, a political sphere, to, so to speak, that is not itself part of the economy that can even out all these different demands so that the baker who sells the bread, so that the people, no matter what work they do, can eat their fill, that the baker can nonetheless live and have a family and pay his apprentices and journeymen from selling the bread to everybody that nourishes people. In order to do this, the first line of defense, so to speak, are the guilds. A guild is an organization that encompasses everybody who works in a craft. That means the masters who are usually in charge, the journeymen and the apprentices. So 
whereas a union in our modern economy organizes just the workers, just the people who get paid wages, a guild would start with the employers, including management and so forth. Where a union is based on the assumption that the workers have to get together and bargain for the wages and working conditions, because if they don't do that, then they will get the short end of the stick. A guild is based on the opposite assumption, not of conflict between the classes, but of harmony between the different levels of the economic hierarchy. The assumption that a journeyman, an apprentice and a master share the same interest in the success of the craft and of the city in which it operates. So for that reason, across the board, for everybody who is a cobbler, a baker, etc. in a city, the guild sets the fair wage if there is ever any dispute. In, in most cases, when the system runs um, on autopilot, it is simply known what the fair wage is. So we could even say that if somebody has to come and write down what the fair wage is, that is already a sign of crisis. The guilds also enforce quality standards. Um, not all pro craft products are created equal. Some masters may be better than others. So not just do the guilds make sure that the people who can call themselves a master or a journeyman are truly highly qualified, but that also the quality of their products stays um, at a high level. And so for that reason, they also get to set prices. Beyond the guild, on the other hand, you have to have a government that can enforce by law the rules that the guilds make for their own part of the economy. So that the fair wages and fair prices in all the different trades match. City government in the early modern era functions by the same principles that we've seen elsewhere. The notion that religious, political and economic authority all have to come from one source. Cities are usually self-governing. That means they have an elected city council and a mayor that answers to that city council. But the city council is not elected by the citizenry according to the principle of one person, one vote. So these elections are not by our standards democratic. Rather, the norm is that everyone is represented based on their economic function in the division of labor. In other words, you get to have a say in governing a city because of the thing you contribute to the greater good, what you do to fill people's, other people's needs. So this is a thought yet that you will find familiar when you look at Winthrop and the way he thinks about the purpose of economic activity. In the usual city council, the guilds would have a reserved number of seats, depending on just how important, wealthy and powerful they are. In some places, they might even have the majority. This was the case in the Swiss city of Basel, for instance, that was essentially run by the guilds. But everywhere else, you can count on having 30 to 40 percent of the seats on a city council reserved for the guilds. Usually you have to be a master to be eligible to serve and the masters that stand for election are elected by the members of the guild. Usually also just the masters get to vote. In many cases elections are complicated by introducing an element of chance. You don't want there to be a concentration of power and you don't want to reward strong ambition. So the guild might elect a slate of three people for two seats and then the two that actually serve will be chosen by lot, um, by lottery in other words. The same might actually also apply to how the mayor is selected. The city council might suggest three people who they think 
would have the qualification to serve, and then again, lots are drawn. The assumption here is that the hand of God or of fate would be in the mix, uh, because not in all cases can people, can men, be trusted uh, with power and decisions that affect who has power. Joining the guilds on the city council are the representatives of all the other aspects of the division of labor. In some of the cities where merchants are economically dominant, they might have a majority of the seats to fill. Where merchants are also heavily specialized in long distance trade versus local trade or inland trade and so forth, they might have different guilds that represent them. Then the clergy has their own contingent of representatives. And the number of people, again, that are these different groups sent to the city council are fixed in the constitution. They may be adjusted sometimes uh, to reflect new additions or a shift in power and economic importance. But at any given time, you know there will be 10 clergymen, 20 merchants, 20 craftsmen and so forth on the city council. So what the crafts do in the guilds, the setting of prices and the regulation of qualities and standards and of wages and so forth has the official endorsement of the political power in the city. They are part of it. So um, it is built into the system that the rules that make sure that everybody who produces and consumes goods gets to have a livelihood, everybody who contributes to the greater good of the city gets to have a livelihood, that is part of the constitutional setup. And because political power and religious power are so closely linked and are in fact conceptually considered more or less the same thing, the religious role that guilds play in a city are also part of this. So when a guild builds their own church, or if they have a reserved pew, or if their patron saint gets to have a special spot in the church building, all of these are symbolic affirmations of the basic political and economic principle of mutual cooperation for the greater good. And one of the greatest examples of guilds asserting their religious um, claim to power, the godliness of what they do, the God-pleasingness of what they do, is when they have processions from a shrine where they honor the saint who is the patron of their craft to the church where they worship or to some other significant place like the market square and so forth. In the physical uh, setup of the city, you often find additional reminders of the importance of morality for the rules that govern everybody's conduct. To give you an example from my own background, in the market square of the city of Bremen stands a large stone statue of a knight with a sword who represents the authority of city government. He is there to protect and to enforce the laws. He is placed, not by accident, directly in the marketplace because people considered with some right that the marketplace is where people might be most tempted not to obey the rules if self-interest gets the better of them. And to also show how this knight, Roland, um, who is not by accident based on the mythological historical figure who led a charge by the Franks in the early Middle Ages or late Dark Ages against Muslim invaders who were trying to get into France uh, from Spain. Uh, so he is also a religious hero in that sense. But his uh, the significant for the marketplace are his kneecaps. On his armor, he has two pointy kneecaps. And the, long, the elongated points on those knees, the distance between the points, between the two knees, are exactly one yard. So this statue, with all he represents, is not just a yardstick for fairness in economic conduct in the abstract, but you can actually go there if somebody sells you a length of cloth, and you can hold it to that statue, and you can measure whether 
they sold you exactly a yard or whether they fudged it. And in other ways, this principle to embody the spirit of economic cooperation of the moral economy uh, in the physical infrastructure of a city applies. 